This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Greetings all and welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join the conversation. You can do so by calling us at area code 808 374 2014 or by tweeting us at thinktechhi. Today we're very fortunate to have a successful author and military officer joining us. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Zakia is a retired Marine, and he was one of the advisors who trained the Iraqi Army's 5th Battalion. His new book, The Ragged Edge, a U.S. Marine's account of leading the Iraqi Army's 5th Battalion, chronicles the way a loosely associated group of individuals can be turned into a successful fighting force. He's joining us today via Skype from his home in Connecticut. Uh, and in addition to that, I must tell you uh, that we are proud to call him uh, an HPU alum and fellow sea warrior. So please help me welcome Lieutenant Colonel Michael Zakia. Hi, Michael. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Um, I read your book, and I was, I was shocked and amazed at so many levels. Um, I don't, I don't want to give it up sort of chronologically, because I really want people who read it to, to have a firsthand example of, of, what, um, of what you experienced. But there were some things that surprised me uh, that I wanted to, to specifically ask you about, because I think there are some misconceptions about what it is that U.S. military officers do when they are in uh, these kinds of advisory roles in other countries. So um, that, that's what I want to focus on. And the first thing I'd like to ask you about is, why do you think you were all so grossly under-resourced? That's a great question. I think that we were grossly under-resourced because the Bush administration had not thought about what happened, what do we do with the Iraqi army after we beat it? Mm -hmm. um, what do we do with all those soldiers? I don't think they anticipated um, the Iraqi army. Uh, I don't think they, or I know they didn't anticipate the insurgency. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was no plan for reconstituting um, an Iraqi army. Uh, so I think that they uh, just didn't put any thought into it. And then I think they panicked when the insurgency sort of exploded. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh my God, we've got to get people and we've got to do something to get, get us out of this. I think it was political, politically motivated, not from the military. Hmm. Now, you, you mentioned the insurgency. And I was very interested to read that uh, the people who enlisted and who eventually became uh, the 5th Battalion came from many different sides of the battle. Uh, we, you might have had former, former regular Iraqi army personnel or other military personnel. You might have had people who were members of fringe kinds of uh, political groups, et cetera. And you had to figure out a way to turn all of those people uh, who may have disagreed with one another and literally have been trying to kill each other in the past, you had to turn them into a team. How did you, how did you figure out the best way to approach that kind of a divergent uh, workforce, for want of a better term? Um, so um, just to put this in context, I. I need to give you props because the class that I took with you at HPU in my master's program included was um, about culture, business culture. Mm -hmm. And so I had a vocabulary and cognitive structure to understand those concepts and what I had to do. Mm -hmm. um, very specifically, a book that we used in your class, Franz Trompenor's Writing the Waves of Culture, I actually brought a copy of that with me and I taught that to my Marines and soldiers as we were developing the, the, the training uh, program. Uh -huh. um, I was extremely aware that there was an entire ocean of cultural shared meaning and communication that we did not have access to, mm -hmm. that we were not privy to. Mm -hmm. um, 
I always emphasized that we were guests in their country and we were their guests specifically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we emphasized and we used, resorted to our Marine Corps training. I refer to this in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, every Marine's a rifleman. Right. And, you know, we had, that's what we said is every soldier is a rifleman. Uh, we're all in this together and we tried to overcome and build, uh, you know, esprit de corps, shared hardship and misery, which is already built in because, you know, we had no buildings, we had very little electricity, uh, we needed water supply, we had very little running water, mm -hmm. um, bad food, uh, bad gear. Um, and so those things, that those hardships and that privation actually helped to gel our battalion mm -hmm. um, in what we called, and what the Iraqis have actually called, the crucible yeah. of uh, hardship. Uh -huh. Hardship can certainly help to build a team. I mean, you know, just ask the Chicago Cubs. Uh, but so, <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, so that's an interesting approach to it. But even within the group of soldiers that you had to deal with, they among themselves had many different cultures because it sounds like you had Sunnis, you had Shiites, there were Yazidis, people from other tribal uh, types of associations, many of whom may have had historical uh, conflicts going way back. And yet somehow you had to figure out a way to have them put it all aside for the good of the entire organization. Um, how did you do that without having them kill each other? Uh, well, you know, it, what's amazing is how profoundly ignorant of Iraq and its history and its peoples we were. Mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of knowledge about it because I, when I was in college, you know, I majored in classics and I had read and I knew of Lawrence of Arabia. Mm -hmm. So I understood a little bit about the region, what he did, mm -hmm. uh, and I used that as a template for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in, in the book, I write this, but I think that there was a lazy political assumption uh, or assumption by the politicians that, you know, uh, an Arab is an Arab is an Arab, whether they're Shia or Sunni or whatever, it didn't matter to, to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that was probably an easy assumption to make. Um, I think that uh, it, what we came to find out is that um, Iraq actually had a history of multi uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious history was mm -hmm. very integrated. At one point during uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, reign, there was a very vibrant and thriving Jewish community, which eventually was driven out of uh, Baghdad. Um, but, you know, it had this history of um, getting along in terms of uh, ethnicities, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, the Turkmen, um, you know, there were Zoroastrians still, which I was surprised by. Uh, the Yazidis, I learned about a lot about the Yazidis. Their religion goes back to, uh, traces back to the last ice age. Mm -hmm. um, and even within the, the Muslim blocs, there are separate uh, sects, not just Sunni and Shia, but other smaller sects that we were not aware of. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I learned all this and I had to try to figure out how to make it work. And I can't say that I had a plan. I just sort of did the best I could when things came up and tried to, you know, give an over. And they seemed to respond to this idea of Wahed Iraq, which means one Iraq, a unified Iraq. Mm -hmm. They're very interested in the idea of unity and singularity or oneness. Mm -hmm. um, so I... I that was a theme that I played to. In fact, at one point in the book, I talk about when I said that we speak with one voice. Right. And that was very motivating to them, and they liked that a lot. Mm -hmm. It also sounds like you had the opportunity to surround yourself with experienced Iraqi uh, personnel who, who were able to really provide assistance as the U.S. military was learning how to work with the Iraqis. Um, uh, Captain Zane and, and uh, Sergeant Major Iskander and those folks. Um, did you become friends with them? What was your relationship like with, uh, with your Iraqi so counterparts? A couple of pieces to that. Uh, one, it was all luck of the draw. And you know, some of the Iraqi soldiers and were very, very good. And uh, many of them were mediocre and some were just outright terrible. And I refer to all three. Um, 
Iskander was a character, and mm -hmm. uh, he he was great, and I loved Iskander. And yes, I was friends with him. Uh, same thing with Zane, um, and you know, Zane is like my brother. Mm -hmm. um, I have helped a number of. Uh, I, later on, when I came back to the United States, I formed a nonprofit with Kirk Johnson from USAID. Mm -hmm. We called it uh, the List Project, and we basically formed a pipeline for helping Iraqis come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I've helped a number of both interpreters and soldiers from my old battalion come here. Um, uh, so yes, I, I was. You know, I talk about Assad, and you know, we weren't friends exactly, mm -hmm. but we knew each other very well. And he was very corrupt, and he has now uh, gone on to become. He's a major general in the Iraqi army, and he is the commanding general of the Western Baghdad Defense District. Mm -hmm. um, Zane, you know, I, I, at the end of the book, I, I talk about how his when Mosul got overrun and his brother was executed by ISIS, yeah. the commanding general of the Iraqi forces that retook Mosul was uh, a, a Lieutenant General Najim al jabouri And so he was from Zane's tribe, and that was... For Iraqis, they would understand that this is the Jabori taking back Mosul and getting avenged on ISIS for the execution of Zane's brother. Mm -hmm. wow. So we in the United States would not recognize that, but because I know to look for this stuff, I recognize the dynamics there. Yeah. It sounds like just an amazing, uh, an amazing lack of knowledge that we have in the West, and particularly in the United States, about uh, people that we would like to have as friends. Um, tell me a little bit about the, this story. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say it made me laugh, but it did. Um, <laughs> tell me about the massive uh, food poisoning incident. Um, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and again, I write about this in the book, and it was this actually a serious deal. Um, yeah, it sounded bad. You know, we had a, a food, a kitchen crew that were Yazidis, and we had no idea at that time who they were, what they were. They were just, you know, the contractors that showed up, and, you know, we didn't have a place to put them, and they were sleeping in the kitchens with the food and, you know, doing their ritual um, cleaning of themselves and stuff in the kitchen, et cetera. Um, the contract required only uh, cultural standards of cleanliness. Mm -hmm. um, for food preparation, and so that met the requirements of the contract. But um, you know, they did not believe, or they, they, um, they did not make a distinction the way we do about food preparation, food safety, and food cleanliness, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so, with the Yazidis, what they began doing is uh, marking the walls around where we lived with uh, feces mm -hmm. to scare the devil away. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were also eating with, you know, handling food. Mm -hmm. um, and so everybody got sick. We had massive uh, food poisoning, uh, you know, well over 100 soldiers. It was a real mess. Um, uh, but then when I tried to teach, and I called in like food specialists from the U.S. Army, we did an inspection, we did a whole thing to overcome because that's real serious especially with the dehydration in the mm -hmm. desert i mean it could be fatal mm -hmm. um and you know when i was trying to teach these guys and most of them have little more than a you know fourth or fifth grade education most of them are semi-literate or functionally illiterate mm -hmm. uh, and i was trying to tell them well you have these invisible bugs that live on your fingers that can get you sick and they were like looking at me like you're crazy they didn't believe me and, you know, how do you prove that? I don't know. I don't know. You know, it never occurred to me that they wouldn't believe me that there were, you know, tiny bugs that were invisible living on their hand. And think about it. When you put it like that, it sounds ridiculous. Would you believe somebody if they told you that? No, you know? I wouldn't. Um, uh, but, you know, we taught them you have to wash your hands before you handle food. Mm -hmm. And you got to wear shoes. And you can't wash yourself in the kitchen. Uh, you know, do your you take a shower where the food is, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got them beds and all that kind of stuff. And after that, we didn't have any problems. But um, yeah, it, but again, this came out of, you know, we had no idea right. what we were dealing with. I was amazed to find out uh, 
when you relate in the book where uh, the the um, food sanitation people that came in said that the entire kitchen crew had to wear shoes and for many of the people you went out and found them shoes and for right. a, and for a lot of those folks it was um, the first pair of shoes they'd ever had uh, yeah and you know these people are for the most part desperately poor yeah um, uh, you know at one point I talked about them playing soccer in the gravel barefoot I mean you know their feet are like uh, uh, you know like leathery kind, you know they can do that I, I could not but um, like luau feet you know, Right. Uh, they think nothing of, you know, being barefoot in, in the gravel and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and, you know, it's interesting. So Islam requires the ritual cleaning five times a day uh, before prayer, cleaning mm -hmm. of your hands uh, and feet before prayer. Um, and I wonder if that was not Muhammad, um, his, his way of introducing, you know, ritual uh, cleanliness into uh, the you know, the daily lives of uh, the Arabs then Yeah. Uh, for exactly that reason. It could have been. Listen, Michael, we need to take a quick break uh, so that we can show our viewers some of the other wonderful programming here on Think Tech Hawaii. But can you stick around because I really want to continue this conversation. Uh, sure, happy to. Great. Uh, we will be right back right after this. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we are talking via telephone with Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel retired Michael Zakia, who is an HPU graduate and who has written a book uh, about his experiences with the Iraqi Fifth Army. It, the, the book is available on Amazon.com, and I highly recommend it. Um, but Michael, since you've been back, uh, your life has taken quite a different turn. Tell us about what you're up to now. Uh, sure. So um, I'm doing a lot. Uh, it took me a while to recover from my wounds. Um, I spent a year in and out of the hospital. Um, I had no memory for a year, basically. Uh, I was medically retired from the Marine Corps. Um, when I retired, I moved to Northwest Connecticut. And I uh, applied to go to the uh, University of Connecticut um, for an MBA, and I started while I was there, and I, I had started a couple of, some advocacy before this, but I started a nonprofit uh, for veterans called the Entrepreneur Bootcamp for Veterans, mm -hmm. and I helped veterans start businesses, and it's been very successful. And that led to a number of opportunities, um, both with the state, I was appointed several uh, gubernatorial task forces on veterans reintegration, um, I am an Obama appointee to the Small Business Administration. Um, I've testified to the Senate a number of times. Uh, I was President Obama's guest at the State of the Union address in 2016. Um, all that said, right now I am starting a United States Veterans Chamber of Commerce. Um, there's 2.5 million veteran-owned businesses in the country that account for about 1.2 trillion dollars in gross domestic product, wow. uh, which is about six percent of the U.S. gross domestic product. Wow. 
uh -huh. uh, that's never been organized. Um, and we are presently in the act of organizing. Uh, basically, we're, we're creating a market. We're connecting supply to demand uh, for veteran-owned businesses to uh, corporate America and to municipal and federal governments, uh, federal agencies who want to contract and want to work with veteran-owned businesses. Wow. Um, there's significant research on uh, the importance and the value creation of uh, veteran-owned businesses in the community that help build community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working on a national level. Um, in the next uh, few months, I'm going to be working with the Department of Defense on several initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and this fall, I will have a big announcement that I'll be able to uh, tell you about should you have me back. But um, I have become very vocal and very visible on a national level in terms of veteran business entrepreneurship. That's good. I I'm glad to hear that. You know, uh, folks that work with military uh, personnel or who have his a history of association, those of us that are uh, Air Force kids and uh, military spouses, etc. We know that the training that the military provides its service members is easily translatable to professions in the civilian sector. I mean, we know that. But right. folks that are not as, as intimately connected with service members uh, may not be aware of just how valuable military training and the, the leadership skills and um, experiences that are provided to service members, how they can really uh, enhance the value proposition of, of any business. Well, if you'll let me throw a couple of statistics at you. Part of what's happening is a decline in the veteran's population overall. Mm -hmm. So since 2000, since the 2000 census, the veteran's population has declined by 25% and it's projected to climb by an additional 33% by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening is a loss of political, social, and economic capital um, at a time when the U.S. population itself is growing. So uh, in the last census, um, there was a part of the survey was, um, do you know a veteran? And 80% of Americans responded that they did not know somebody who had served in the military. Wow. Um, so we're getting very concerned about the shrinking, the, both the raw number of shrinkage and the relative shrinkage of the veteran population compared to the overall population. Right. So is part of that encouraging people perhaps to consider spending some time in the military? Uh, yes, I, I think, or in some sort of national service to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. um, what it is that veterans go through and what they have to offer. Um, unfortunately, and I work a lot with corporations, uh, there continues to be uh, talent managers and hiring managers continue to assign a risk premium to veteran job applicants because of post-traumatic stress and medical issues uh, and being lost to the workforce. Hmm. So it's a barrier that we have to overcome. But it, are um, there I any, do, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, are there any statistics to support uh, this this added risk factor? Uh, there were. It, it's improved, but I've been told by hiring managers that uh, there was a risk premium associated with a veteran hire. Another barrier to entry that we have with veterans is what economists call a um, um, uh, uh, something that the, the it's about changes, technology and change. And essentially, and I forgot the technical term now, it just slipped from my mind, but essentially hiring managers look at veterans as people who have been out of the workforce for four or eight or 20 years. So they think that they don't have current technical skills mm -hmm. and they're not adaptable to change. There's it, a very severe misperception of the military. Yeah, that's veteran. called skills obsolescence. Uh, yes, um, no, technological skills obsolescence. Right. right. And, uh, well, it sounds to me like you could use a really sharp HR person 
who shall remain <laughs> nameless, who might be able to, co to, to partner with you to really, to tell the real story about just how valuable military experience can be within an organization. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, Cheryl, I am working with somebody in Hawaii to start a Hawaii State Veterans Chamber of Commerce. Oh, fantastic. Well, as soon as you get that up and going, we're going to have to fly you yes. out here. I will introduce to you to her. Fant good. Yes, do that. Um, but the other thing, I guess, I, I would like to say, since we have HR people that watch this show, if you are under the mistaken impression that people with military experience are not as well qualified as other people based solely on their military experience, you are mistaken. Because there's not another group of people that is as resilient, as flexible, and as willing to take risks to accomplish a goal uh, than, than somebody with military history. Because that's what you're trained to do, ultimately. And I think, Michael, that your book proves that statement to a T. You know, had you not been uh, resilient, flexible, and, and willing to take risks, the Iraqi army wouldn't have had a 5th Battalion. Right. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, Cheryl, I actually started, so the, even though it was the 5th Battalion, it was the 1st. Okay. So I actually started the 1st uh, Iraqi unit in the Iraqi army. Uh -huh. um, and at a time when no American had ever done what I did. Right. And that is the historic significance of, of this and why I wrote the book. Um, but if I can just capitalize on what you said, um, so I think that what veterans have to offer in the workforce or, uh, or starting a business are uh, a mission accomplishment and a bias for action. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, uh, it's what I call business speak versus middle speak. And the two speaks don't necessarily understand each other. And I've gotten to a point where I can talk to either one and try to bring them to the middle. And that's what we're trying to do with the overall market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you luck with that because, as, as I said, uh, a person with deep military connections, uh, I'm on your side. Uh, and, and I know uh, the kinds of leadership abilities that come out of a military experience. Um, we are going to have to wrap in just a minute here. But Michael, thank you so much for joining us. And could you take maybe a couple of seconds to uh, share some props for your fellow Marines and service members? Uh, sure. So um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to give you my, the website for my book. Oh, fantastic. It's, yes. It's, uh, you know, uh, the raggededgebook.com. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, it's available at Amazon. It's also available uh, through Barnes & Noble. Um, so it's also available on audiobook and, you know, all that stuff, Kindle, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, the extraordinarily uh, good, uh, fortune and privilege to work with, uh, thousands of veterans, uh, nationwide. Um, I am working with the Vietnam veterans of America on what they're calling a rotation of policy leadership mm -hmm. on veterans issues as they... Uh, both are leaving the workforce and, you know, at some point in the future, uh, departing into history. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very concerned that, um, and to a man, they will tell me, we don't want what happened to us to happen to your generation of veterans. And I think that that's a commitment that we can carry forward. Um, we're going to be dealing with the ramifications and the implications of this war and the veteran population until well into the middle, the middle of this century. Yeah, that's um, true. It's war isn't over when they sign the armistice, right? So um, there's there are going to be a lot of issues that we have to deal years. with. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, before uh, peak payments for veterans issues uh, are reached, mm -hmm. so you know we're looking at like 2050 to 2060 right. before we even peak with this. It, it's going to be a big job for many decades to come. Yeah. Well, you certainly. Uh, have my support as well as my undying gratitude uh, for joining me today. We're going to have to wrap it up right now, but I would urge every single one of you that's watching right now to get online and buy Michael's book and read it. It's, it's fantastic, and it will teach you a lot about our brothers uh, and sisters in the Middle East. So that does it for us. 
on working together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, and we will be back in two weeks. Aloha.